You are listening to the Tri-Order Transmissions. Weekly Trek, Episode 11. First week of July, 2018. Track the Tricorder Transmissions weekly news show for the first week of July 2018. I am Jeff Hewlett, and you can hear me on many of the shows here on our network. And here along with me today is the co-host of our Politrek show. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Namaste, Homo sapiens. I am Shashank Kavaru, <laughs> co-host of Politrex. You cannot hear me on many shows. You, they, I am so crazy. I've been limited to one show, but it's, I think, one of our best shows, uh, Politrex. Oh, for sure. Okay. I've seen so much great feedback uh, on the Politrex show. It's It's been really amazing to see all the people talking back and forth uh, with you guys about the show. And, and we've gotten some comments on our YouTube channel as well. So very well received and a very well executed show by you and, and Barry. Um, who we've also been on Weekly Trek before. So uh, you hear a lot of Shashank on Weekly Trek, though, which is nice. Uh, uh, I love I love uh, bringing out my nerdy CNN side where I <laughs> get to sit down and analyze really seriously about really silly things like action figures. Yeah, oh, so God, it's... I'm an action figure junkie. Uh, I've got Trek action figures all over my recording studio here. So uh, we're, we're in the same vein there. Jeff, uh, you and I should talk after the recording. Oh, I... I have no doubt. And we'll be talking at STLV here in a few weeks. Absolutely. So uh, I'm sure that will come up. Um, so let's jump into some of the latest Trek news, starting with, I guess, what's probably the saddest story. Uh, Harlan Ellison, the writer of one of the most popular Star Trek episodes of all time, The City on the Edge of Forever, uh, has passed away at the age of 84. I was really privileged to have met him at Star Trek Las Vegas a few years ago uh, when IDW released their origi- the, his original City on the Edge story as a series of comic books and then later as a graphic novel. So uh, it, was, it was great to see him at his table. And as well as he did a, a wonderful, wonderful panel with um, the, the incredible Grace Lee Whitney, uh, who is no longer uh, with us as well. They were, they were great friends from the Star Trek days. And, you know, he was really well known for being kind of a cantankerous guy but uh, he was a fantastic writer and had so many great books published, and, and he will be be very missed. Absolutely. Uh, I delve into two big communities. One is Star Trek. The other one is comic books. Mm. And I was so surprised to see every other comic book celebrity person tweeting something about how Harlan Ellison influenced them, how yes. they read his work, how... They met him at some point, they wrote under him, and they learned under him. So it's nice to see that there were people back then who had realized that these are the franchises of the future, are these comic books and sci-fi and how it's going to rule the world one day. And <laughs> sure enough, look how uh, how many people are talking about something that used to be called pulpy and just mm-hmm. sci-fi throwaway stuff back yeah. in the 60s and 70s when he was big. It's, yeah. just, it's, it's great that we had the opportunity to enjoy his work. I agree. And, you know, my uncle, who I've mentioned on uh, Tricorder shows many times, the guy that got me into Star Trek was a big Harlan Ellison fan. Uh, He had quite a few of his books. um, So I'd heard about Harlan very early on in my life. So uh, having had the the chance to actually meet him in person was was one of those STLV memories that I'm I'm really, really look back fondly on. So uh, what was he like as a person? He was just exactly as you have heard. <laughs> he, <laughs> he had a very, very strong personality. He spoke his mind, um, extremely outspoken. But he had a, a, a funny side to him as well. Although you wouldn't necessarily, he, he wouldn't show it as a funny side. Like when he when he made a wisecrack, he wouldn't laugh afterwards. He would just drop it and leave it there. He was a very, very dry guy in that way. But um, he had a lot of charm to him. Uh, he had, had very strong convictions as well. So uh, definitely a very unique personality. That's wonderful to hear. I'm glad you got the opportunity to meet him and talk to him. And I, we all just need to rewatch City on the Edge of Forever, just his memory. Yeah, yes, yeah. Maybe. And, and uh, you know what? I'll tell you, um, you know, City on the Edge of Forever was 
obviously one of the most iconic Star Trek episodes, if not one of the best TOS episodes. But if you if you are a fan of that and you have not read uh, the 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 original version uh, or read the the comics or the graphic novel, get your hands on it because it is incredible the differences uh, between what Harlan originally intended and and what made it to the screen. So um, definitely worth checking that out uh, if you haven't seen that yet. Have you have you read that yet, Shashank? No, it's something I have ordered and I'm yet to get simply because mm-hmm. there are so many people buying it now because it just got new relevance. Of and course, yeah. Trouble getting a copy, but this would be a good time to just maybe talk a little bit about reading track. We do uh, comic book reviews there. Mm-hmm. I do it sometimes. I guest star with Will and Marty, and we've talked about doing the series, so that will definitely be on reading track at some point in the near future. Oh, yeah. Def- you guys definitely should do that, and, and that would be a, an incredible discussion. Uh, I'd love to even actually be involved in that as well because it's uh, – it's it's a shocking difference uh, between the the actual TV episode and, and what he originally intended and what came out as the the comic book. So, you know, keep me in mind uh, when you guys absolutely. do that. Absolutely, another, another thing for us to talk about after the recording. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, um, let's see. So what... Moving on to, uh, I know we started off on a somber note, but I have a bit of oh. what is now really good news, but could be insanely great news. Yes, is. Uh, Patrick Stewart might be returning to Star Trek. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I, I, I am a uh, an avid skeptic. So, I mean, I know this is based partly on a, a rumor of a verbal agreement between uh, him and CBS, as well as some comments that he made uh, about having to watch uh, Discovery at some point soon. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that this rumor is true. I would love to see Captain Picard back in action. Yet again, and I, I think this is an interesting speculative discussion, right? I mean, what, what if, if this is true, what could they be planning for him? Is this, you know, the adventures of Captain Picard in the future? Is this, uh, you know, I can't even really wrap my head around as I can't, can't just be a, a retread of, of TNG. Right. As great as Picard is, it can't be like a Joey, the spin-off of Friends kind of thing where yeah. he's just by himself. That would just... The, one of the big reasons why Picard works is because he has that awesome crew around him who mm-hmm. play off of him so well. So I'm wondering if they'll either at least take us back to that USS Pasture situation in All Good Things mm. where he ha- he jumps from ship to ship and from age to age and he manages to fight this anti-time crisis. Mm-hmm. If it was something like that and maybe a good 8 to 10 limited episode series, I think that would be really good. But again, given Patrick Stewart's age, given the age of his crew, well, would you at least agree that if he's coming back, you know, the crew has to come back in some form, right? Uh, yeah, I I don't know. I, I it, That seems to be a huge undertaking to get all of them, you know, back on board. I was kind of goofing around thinking about this earlier and I was thinking you know what about a solo Captain Picard goes back to the Nexus and just has fun and adventure nice. <laughs> in the Nexus <laughs> but um, no I, I don't know I, I don't want to get my hopes up uh, too high but it would be nice to see uh, you know at least some of the TNG crew back uh, for at least some sort of a, a I don't want to I, I hate to use the word reboot or um, you know sequel but you know, it, the obvious thought is is they'll put, you know, they're back on the Enterprise or maybe they have another ship and they're off doing, you know, this the adventure is all over again, you know, different time, different place. But that's the obvious direction, I would think. But uh, maybe they're going to surprise us. I mean, Discovery was a surprise in direction. So who knows what they're thinking? You know, I'll say one thing. If Q and Picard don't lay next to each other and talk <laughs> yes. while Picard's shirt is half open, there is really no point in doing this. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's that's another that's another question. Are we going to bring back uh, any of the the series uh, popular villains like Q? I mean, that would be really interesting uh, to see what uh, what he's up to these days because you know he never really shows up much outside of that. So. Um, he didn't make an appearance in any of the TNG movies either, so it would be fun to see if he actually uh, came back and what villains uh, they might you know, look back on and, and revisit for some new series with Picard. He did bookend that series. He started on the pilot mm-hmm. and then he definitely was a big part of the finale, so mm-hmm. it would feel a little weird and out of place if he wasn't there. I completely agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you too. So, well, you know, just mentioned Discovery. 
um, you know, there's a there's a some really good news for Star Trek Discovery that that just came out. That um, a couple of uh, Saturn Awards uh, were awarded to the show. Uh, Best New Media Television Series uh, was the first one, and I think this is really interesting to me because it was up against some really really popular shows like Stranger Things and The Handmaid's Tale. And I think it says a lot about Discovery and CBS All Access as well that, you know, what, what I hate to say the word niche, but a niche streaming network uh, that's up against some serious heavyweights uh, in the industry uh, walks away with this, uh, this award. That is incredible to me. I think to me, it heralds the fact that Star Trek has come back in a big, bad way mm -hmm. that you know, irrespective of what the critics were saying, irrespective of what people take to Twitter and say things, when they say things like, this is not really Trek. My Trek is my Trek. Discovery mm -hmm. is not Trek. And what Discovery is doing is not really, is, is in a way embarrassing Trek. When people say all that things and then we see this evidence, the proof is in the pudding. The, the mm -hmm. fact that the show is back and it's really Trek for this new generation was really, uh, it was capped off by this big achievement. Another really incredible achievement to me, which was more surprising than the Best New Media, was the Best Actress Award for mm -hmm. Sinequa Martin-Green. Yeah. Especially I because she went up against such, uh, like, similarly big, big-named uh, celebrities. People from, uh, like, Gillian Anderson from mm -hmm. The X-Files, Lena Headey from Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. and all of them were beat by our delightful michael burnham that was awesome yeah that is amazing to me and i i, I was so happy to see that because <clears throat> i think it was pretty well deserved you know she did a fantastic job as michael burnham and it was nice to see her get acknowledged for that like you said especially up against some bigger names from from incredible incredibly popular tv shows like the x-files and game of thrones i mean you know that's some stiff competition for you right there it's a uh, after the year she has had of the incredible highs and lows, starting off with Discovery doing so well, and then people finding the show slowly and getting getting on to the show itself. It's hard not to take it personally when you are the person headlining the show and there is so much negativity about the show. The fact that she's the one who got this award makes me feel like, you know, she deserves it after everything she's, she's been going through. Yeah. Just with dealing with that negativity, uh -huh, that yeah. rampant toxic negativity, you know, it's just uh -huh. great to see that uh, and she actually, I believe, gave her acceptance speech from the Star Trek Discovery set where they're filming season two. So she's doing great. Yeah, she is doing great. And it's, and it's a real shame. Uh, but I think you guys on Politrex just did an episode about, um, you know, the social media and, and the, the, the vitriol that's being spread out there uh, against a lot of these shows. And I mean, we're seeing it with the Star Wars franchise now, too, with uh, all the backlash about The Last Jedi and... Um, some of the some of the stars from that movie, you know, leaving social media because of the just the horrible fan backlash. So, you know, uh, hats off to Sinequa for for pulling down this award. And it, I think it means so much now in, in this in this age where people can be so cruel and horrible uh, online and say such terrible negative things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so I'm so proud that that she got that award and that she's you know holding her head up so high and and celebrating it. So. Uh, really, really, really great accolades for Discovery. When you say cruel, negative online things about Star Trek, it's hard for me right now not to think of the Star Trek Mission Crate, mm -hmm. which is uh, a service that was started last year by Loot Crate. And they were their plan was to send out one crate every two months. Yep. For those of you who are not in the know, Loot Crate is a subscription service, and they send out four to six items that are use, that are nerdy. There, there. Uh, you get a nerdy T-shirt. You get some kind of a figure. Usually, mm -hmm. you get some something, uh, some kind of memorabilia from various franchises. And they made a very specific Star Trek uh, crate called Star Trek Mission Crate. And they were supposed. They started, I believe, sometime late last year. And the first crate was supposed to be there in November with everyone who had subscribed. But that ended up being February. And since then, people have not gotten any crates, and uh, it's just it's just been uh, a debacle. I'll let you get your thoughts in, but I just want everybody to know I am an annual subscriber to their regular crate, so I'll tell you more about that once your thoughts <laughs> come in. 
Oh, well, my God, I remember um, almost buying into this uh, when it was announced. I was so close and I had a couple of friends who actually did buy into the, the yearly subscription for the Mission Crate. And I feel their pain. Um, you know, I think reading through this and another one of the issues that's going to pop up here is that some people in the near future are going to wind up hitting their uh, renewal for their $245 yearly membership. And so far they've received one crate uh, with the potential for a second one sometime soon. So, uh, and of course, monthly subscribers have been charged their, their $40 a month, regardless of whether these crates have shipped. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't like to be negative, but you know, this is, this is one of those times where I can completely understand uh, you know, people being negative about this online because this is pretty unacceptable in my opinion. Yeah, imagine you spent one month's big chunk of your savings where you were going to maybe buy some more groceries or buy mm -hmm. some furniture and you said, no, I'm going to commit to buying this new uh, subscription service that I want to support because it's my favorite franchise. Mm -hmm. And you spent $245. That's nothing to laugh at. No. And it's the years coming around and people got one crate so far mm -hmm. when they should have gotten their fifth by now and been waiting on the sixth. Mm -hmm. So I would be very surprised if this lasts until next year. But mm -hmm. as I said, I'm an annual subscriber of the regular crate, which just gives me non, sometimes Star Trek, sometimes other franchises. And I'll be honest, I've only really had one time, just once in the last year, where one of my crates was delayed. So I am, I am, I was one of those people who was very supportive of this in the beginning. I urged Barry, my co-host, to give this a chance. He hates me for it now, <laughs> but it's. Uh, I I certainly was one of those people who was disappointed as well, uh, especially given that my experience with their non-Star Trek crates had been really good. Yeah, I'd heard a lot of good things about the the loot crate outside of the Star Trek. I, I have a couple of friends of mine who are subscribers to that, and they've been pretty happy with it. Um, and of course, that's why I was tempted when this was announced, and I was very, very close to pulling the trigger on it. But you know, I've had some, I've had some financial issues over the last couple of years, and I just, you know, I could, I just couldn't commit that amount of money to it. And I guess now I'm happy that I didn't, because uh, this seems like it, it. This could be a crash and burn type scenario uh, in the near future. I, I can't imagine if they get to the the year of subscription renewal phase and they've only gotten two crates out. Um, you know, because then your your two hundred forty five dollars is gone, and you've got two crates for it, and that I don't think that's worth it in any uh, way of thinking. I just um, I really hope they get this thing together, but I'm I'm not seeing much of a positive direction for this at this point. Even St Star Trek fans who are known for their positivity and their fresh and optimistic outlook, when you take an entire year out of their uh, their money bank and you give them one crate for $245 because if you look at it now I'm sure it's $245 plus shipping and mm -hmm. or tax or whatever and all they've gotten is one crate and never even gotten that exclusive start uh, enterprise that they were supposed to get for subscribing for a year so when you have so many problems I would be very very surprised if, if this lasts into the next year I am expecting a cancellation announcement very soon. People will start getting either the refunds or they will do something to somehow make up for that money. But this is so disappointing. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. And, you know, it, Star Trek merchandising over the years has been spotty and hit and miss. And there's been some great stuff like the Diamond Select figures. And there's been some not so great stuff over the years. And I know the franchise has been handed back and forth between different toy companies. And you know, it, it's just a kind of a punch in the gut that yet another Star Trek merchandising effort has, you know, gone so horribly wrong. Would you think had Star Trek done the Star Wars thing and stuck to one company and just let them do everything that they want their franchise to do? Do you think that would have benefited it better than... Mm -hmm let's say, what Star Trek is doing, which is like, hey, do you want to sell our franchise? Here you go. Hey, do you want to sell our franchise? Here you go to about 20 companies. Yeah, I, you know what? I, I don't know. I think there's some upsides and downsides uh, to the way that it's been done. I mean, let's let's say uh, there are some really great pieces of Star Trek merchandise out there, and there are some great companies making 
Star Trek merchandise and uh, oh, let's take fan sets for instance uh, you know they make some amazing Star Trek pins and it's great that they were able to get a license to do that and if CBS or Paramount had gone exclusive with one company you know we may not have some of the great stuff that we have today so I'm, I'm hesitant to, to, to say that they should have gone the way the Star Wars did um, but of course we've already mentioned some of the downsides where there have been some you know less than stellar Star Trek products uh, created and sold over the years. So uh, mixed bag, but I, I think if I had to choose between the two, I would I would choose the way it's being done right now, um, and just you know take the take the knocks with some of the bad stuff and revel in all the good things. Uh, like I said, some of the Diamond Select figures are just phenomenal. Some of the, the new ones that are coming out look really really great. So mm-hmm. um, I think things the are looking McFarlane? up. Yes, the McFarlane ones. Yeah, it's a. Uh... Have you seen the toys that made us start oh, yes. episode yet? Of course, uh, yeah. For, for those who haven't, please see it. There is a parachuting Kirk, yes. which is just Kirk with a parachute attached to it. Oh, God, there's so much great <laughs> stuff in that. And that the early days of the hodgepodge of Trek merchandise is just unbelievable. You, you, and, uh, yeah. Uh, I believe uh, they came full circle with J.J. Abrams actually putting mm-hmm. a parachuting Kirk in the, yes. in the first movie. <laughs> yes, they did. Oh, great stuff. Great stuff. Uh, uh, what uh, else do we have? Know, uh, moving on to, J- I'm glad I mentioned J.J. Abrams because every time I think of him, I think of not his Star Wars movie, but his Star Trek universe that he has set up. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, do you remember that big kerfuffle about the Zachary, uh, I'm sorry, about the Quentin Tarantino uh, mm-hmm. Star Trek movie? And we haven't heard a lot about it since that news broke. For those who are interested, we also on Polytrex did a 30 minute side episode where we just talked about what that could be but Zachary Quinto recently came out with a statement saying that you know the the his original cast the 2009 Star Trek cast will be coming back for Quentin Tarantino's movie which uh, brings again a little bit of confusion because there is Star Trek 4 that's happening in which uh, Chris Hemsworth is going to be back. I believe a deal has been signed and the script is being written currently. And then there is the Quentin Tarantino movie that is coming out. So are they planning two movies that are going to be four and five? Are they planning four and something completely different like the Mirror Star Trek? Because that is something I would want to see Quentin Tarantino do. And I don't know how good he would be with futuristic, soft, soft, not soft-spoken, but more positive less negative star trek but i think he would do a really good star trek mirror universe movie that is what i'm hoping to see but apparently quentin tarantino's idea does bring back the jj abrams cast what do you think about that mm, yeah i've i've been i've been one of the detractors of the the quentin tarantino star trek uh, movie idea I, I i've just not i've not been a big fan of tarantino his films. I mean, there's a couple, of course, that are great, but overall, I, I have not I have not been a big fan of his over the years. So I was a little concerned uh, when when this rumor and these announcements started to come out. So I mean, I, not like I won't go see it, but I, I don't know his his style of movie making and and Star Trek to me just doesn't seem to gel well. I could be wrong, of course. It could be fantastic. I don't know, uh, but yeah, I, I'm I'm not not super optimistic about it. So I, I hope I'm proven wrong. See, that's how I felt. And even though I am a Quentin Tarantino fan, allow me a minute to just hopefully bring you on the side of where good it might actually be good. Is uh, I, I was under the, the same impression. This guy who makes westerns about uh, African-American bounty hunters who go shoot people is going to make a Star Trek movie. What? And then I realized Justin Lin made Star Trek Beyond one of the best Star Trek movies. And that guy made movies about people jumping off of parachutes with with parachutes attached to their cars while they try to go steal gasoline in in the Fast and the Furious franchise. So I am I'm hoping uh, also because Quentin Tarantino has stated multiple times that Star Trek is one of his big inspirations. How he watched the original series growing up and how he's a fan of the next generation. So I'm hoping a lot of that will rub off, and I'm hoping. There is a good mix there because if it's all of these guys and it's J.J. Abrams who are still who is still in my opinion yet to make a bad Star Trek movie, I am I am definitely looking forward to and certainly hoping that this will be good. Uh, yeah, well, I'm I'm joining you in being hopeful. Um, 
I see your point about about Lynn, uh, but I think my my issue, and I don't want to get into a, a rabbit hole about Tarantino and and uh, arguing about people's taste, but in it for me, a lot of his movies seem very self indulgent, and uh, I just I don't know if that works for Star Trek. I mean, hopefully, since he was so inspired by Star Trek, he will uh, maybe not be as self indulgent uh, with his Star Trek movie if he makes one. But uh, what remains to be seen. So I'm going to be um, optimistic about it. And uh, I will absolutely go see it when it comes out and hope for the best. Speaking of optimistic, there is an article out on IndieWire that talked about how there is a fan out there from the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Uh, his name is, uh, I believe his name is, I don't think they, either they didn't, uh, it says Easton. So I guess they decided to not keep his first name or maybe that's his first name, but that's all we have in the article. Anyway, this person, uh, for those of you who do not know, the Make-A-Wish Foundation helps grants big dream-like wishes for children suffering from terminal diseases. And Easton from Missoula, Montana is battling cyst cystic fibrosis and he's 15 years old and he's a big fan of Discovery. So his wish was to go on to the set of Discovery. What he, what happened is not only did he get to visit the set, they turned him into one of the Discovery Klingons. And uh, he, if, for those of you interested, it's on IndieWire. I'm looking at the picture and he looks so much like Walk and all of the cool Klingons that the show started with. He has his own little dagger that he's posing off with. It's it's just another beautiful, hopeful side little nugget about the franchise that we love so much is, they, how, is how much they love us back. And this is just a good way to understand and just think more about that, if you ask me. Yeah, no, I agree. Make-A-Wish is a wonderful thing, and they, they do a lot of great, great, great things for... Um, these kids who have um you know debilitating diseases and it's it's great that star trek is now part of that uh that legacy of, of fulfilling these kids dreams and and I, i'm very humbled to see that and you know kudos uh kudos to everyone who helped make his dream come true and and bring some happiness and joy and light into what is probably a very difficult life to live so uh it's it's a beautiful thing it really is See, I don't mean to delve too much into the negativity of things, but because everything has been going on uh, just around how we should get on our keyboards and hate a franchise, it, it dissuades people like this who yes. really love something and they enjoy this so much that one of their last wishes is, hey, can I go visit the set of this thing I love so much? And then there are people who wake up every morning and all they want to do is type up on the internet how much they hate Michael Burnham, how much they hate a gay couple on the show. It's just, it's so heartbreaking to see that. But news like this brings me a lot of joy. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And, and uh, it's a, it is a good ray of sunshine uh, amidst all of the, the negativity uh, that we've seen around that you just talked about, about Discovery. And, and we, we try not to talk too much about that here on the Tricorder Transmission shows, but uh, it's a good point. It's a good point. We need some more positive messages from Star Trek, and this is definitely one of them. And uh, giving you a little more positive news, something that I just wanted to share with you. On Trek Core, they recently announced that a lot of the new Star Trek merchandise that's coming out is, is all of the classic films. We have the Star Trek jacket from uh, our, the, the bomber jacket that's shown in the original series films. And then you have a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of cool STCC exclusives that you can find, things like your cell phone pouches that uh, have the uh, Star Trek TOS logos mm. and just a lot of uh, classic Trek merchandise, which again, it's just, that's always been around, but this new focus, this renewed focus on the original series I have a theory on that, and I will share that with you. But what do you think of all this, the original series merchandise, the TNG merchandise coming back? Well, um, you know, I am all about there being more Trek merchandise. And, you know, I, I've always been someone who wanted uh, merchandise from the original series. So to see that stuff coming back gives me more opportunity to pick up more of it. So, you know, I, I have original series stuff all over my studio. I mean, figures, I've got the mega block sets, I've got 
the diamond select figures. I've got models and dioramas, and all kind of Christmas ornaments. I've got all kinds of TOS stuff around. So uh, my door is always wide open for more stuff to be put out. And I think, you know, more Trek merchandise coming out is always a good thing. Um, you know, keep that keep that flow coming and great for TNG fans as well. So, you know, especially, hey, if this new Patrick Stewart thing works out, I bet you there'll be a lot of people looking for that TNG merchandise. Uh, it's interesting that you say Christmas ornaments because one of the other updates shared in this article is Hallmark and how they're coming out with a lot of new ornaments mm-hmm. and new little dolls for, from TOS and the animated series. But one particular plus doll that I think you'll be really interested in is a two, two, 2500 limited edition mm. Gone doll. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be an exclusive at SDCC, and they're only making 2,500 pieces of it. Oh, but great. It's adorable and terrifying. That's great. So that means I'm going to have to hit eBay right after that and see if I can get one. Because <laughs> there's <laughs> yeah. no way I'm making that con. <laughs> uh, that will be expensive, though, especially since they're limited to 2,500 pieces. But oh, my course. theory is uh, with all of this is that. I think it's because there is uh, a lot of TOS that we are going to see in some form in the next season of Discovery. Yes. Yes. Well, with the appearance of the Enterprise, um, you know, we still don't know, you know, what what they're going to find on that bridge. But, you know, I I think it's going to rekindle some TOS fire. I think there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be clamoring for uh, new merchandise uh, and, and things to buy. And, you know, it's going to be nostalgia fest a little bit, at least for me. I, I know that a lot of people were kind of rolling their eyes when the Enterprise flew up. But I was one of those ones that was in the rah-rah camp. I was like, yes, OK. Hopefully now we're going to see some some more of the adventures of, of Captain Pike. And hopefully we'll see uh, Spock. And I, I, hopefully that, that spurs some more interest in TOS and, and uh, the series that started it all, you know. It's a, there was a behind the scenes video shared by the crew from Star Trek Discovery where we got to see Anson Mount Spike, but from behind, and he's wearing his uh, gold tunic top. And nice. It's a, like, I really think there is going to be a lot of Star Trek TOS. And I, I am so delighted because uh, I imagine for a sizable amount of that Discovery audience, they might have never seen the original series, mm-hmm. or they might have just heard rumblings about it. For them, all Star Trek could be are are the J.J. Abrams movies and this Discovery. Yeah. So with all that they might see in the show, I'm excited for them to go back and explore the original series, which is, by the way, available everywhere. You can find it on Netflix, oh, yeah. Amazon Prime, I think Hulu has it. And it's, it's great that uh, Star Trek is jumping on the bandwagon and they're ahead of the game by getting all the new merchandise out with the original series. Because they know once this kicks in, people will start looking for this stuff. Yep. No, it's smart. It's very, very smart. So, uh, you know, more optimism for Season 2 of Discovery. And I like that uh, they're, they're getting this merchandise out ahead of time. So in anticipation that uh, there's going to be a lot of demand for it. So actually, all good news. All good news. All Do we have anything else? For this week? No, it's it's a uh, it's very coincidental. We started and ended with something about the original series. Ah, well, well very apropos for me being on this week's episode. So, <laughs> since that's my favorite uh, Star Trek series, so well, Shatak, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, catching up and talking to you and uh, on on Weekly Trek, and we'll be back again next week as always with another episode of Weekly Trek with potentially two different hosts uh, yet again. So. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, Shashank, where can people find you and Politrex online if they're looking for you? Absolutely. We are on Twitter and Facebook at Politrex. That's P-O-L-I-T-R-E-K-S. We try to say smart things every now and then, but mostly it's just (laughs) jokes that Barry and I make. So if you like Star Trek humor or you like smart things, follow us there. You can find me on at gutter underscore hero, G-U-T-T-R underscore H-E-R-O on Twitter. I'm not on Facebook, but I'd love to talk to you on Twitter. I'm happy to explain to you the meaning of my username. There you go. That's a great conversation. (laughs) There you go. That's a conversation starter for you. Uh, I am Warp Factor Jeff on Twitter, and you can find me and the rest of the Tricorder Transmissions host at the Tricorder Transmissions.com. 
tricordertransmissions.com and the Tricorder Transmissions on Facebook. And as we're on our way out, we also have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions, where you can go to our website, the Tricorder Transmissions.com, and click on the big orange Patreon button. And if you do decide to become a patron of our show on our network, uh, you will find some great benefits like getting early releases of some of our shows, getting unedited releases of some of our shows. Uh, we host monthly chats where our patrons can dial into a call with some of our hosts and talk Trek for an hour or two. Uh, and we also have an exclusive, exclusive Patreon pin uh, that is available to all of our members, our patrons, uh, for free. So if you join at any level, any patronage level, doesn't mean it can be a dollar or anything else, you get access to all of that stuff. So uh, please consider joining our Patreon family if you like what we do here on Weekly Trek or any of our shows here on the Tricorder Transmissions Network. So, And thank you, of course, to all of our existing patrons. We love all of you guys. So uh, that brings Weekly Trek to a close this week, and uh, we'll be back again next week uh, for another episode uh, talking about news, and you will have quite a few other shows uh, released on the network between now and then. So we will see you next week or even sooner if you listen to any of our other shows. Live long and prosper. Yes. Live long and prosper, everybody. Thanks for listening.